The Disney Cruise Line is, by many, considered to be one of the best cruise lines operating today. Their fleet of four ships sail to destinations that range from Europe to Mexico and to Alaska. The Bahamas, their original and most popular destination, has the special distinction of making stops at Castaway Key, Disney's private island. Like most Disney escapes, Castaway Key is a picture-perfect getaway with a carefully crafted backstory that was dreamed up by Disney's Imagineers. The real story of Castaway Key, however, is far more interesting. Now, today the island is known as Castaway Key. It's the name that Disney gave it in the summer of 1996 while it was being developed for the Disney Cruise Line. However, up until that point, the island went by the name of Gorda Key. So first, let's talk about the buried treasure of Gorda Key. That's right, real, actual treasure. In 1656, a convoy of ships from the Spanish fleet was passing through the Little Bahama Bank while making its way back to Spain. They found themselves in strong winds that took them into particularly shallow waters, and it was then that the rear guard of the convoy, the Nuestra Señora de las Maravillas, ended up colliding with another ship. At the time, the ship was carrying over 5 million pesos worth of cargo, including coins, silver bars, jewels, and more. All of it sank with the ship, and the vast majority of the 700 souls on board died that night. Of course, the Spanish fleet wasn't about to let all of that cargo just sit at the bottom of the ocean, so over the following few years, various ships were hired and ordered to salvage as much of it as possible. Funny enough, but most of the silver that had gone down with the ship had itself been salvaged from an even earlier shipwreck in 1654. The following year after the wreck, two salvage ships were transporting some of the recovered cargo from the site of the wreck to Puerto Rico when they themselves ended up shipwrecked. This time, the wreck occurred just south of Gorda Key. It was reported that some of the survivors buried whatever they could save from the wreck on the island itself. Now, before you start packing your shovels and setting off on a Disney cruise to find buried treasure, the salvage on the island was later recovered, as was plenty of the salvage that had gone down with the ships. However, between shifting sands, weather, primitive technology, and mapping and record keeping that wasn't always completely accurate, it wasn't common for everything to be salvaged from a wreck. Most of the time, a good amount of it would end up lost. Also, by the way, if you're keeping track, that would mark the third time in four years those silver bars would sink to the bottom of the ocean. Look, I'm not saying cursed treasure exists, but you know, if it did exist, it's probably what it would look like. Now let's fast forward over 250 years and meet a man named Art Silverbar McKee. Born in 1910 in New Jersey, Arthur McKee Jr. would be known by many as the pioneer of modern day treasure diving. His love of diving would not only flourish, but develop into a business that allowed him to make a living out of salvage diving. He had found valuable artifacts here and there, but it would be his Gorda Key expedition that would be his defining break. He set out with a team of divers to Gorda Key in hopes of finding salvage from what was believed to be the wreckage of the San Pedro. Now today we know that wasn't the case. In the 1960s, the actual wreckage of the San Pedro would be discovered closer to the Florida Keys. The wreckage they were actually exploring was that of the two ill-fated salvage ships that were coming from the Maravillas. Art would find on that diving expedition three silver bars weighing 60, 70, and 75 pounds each, and it would be what earned him the nickname Silver Bar. Art would continue to dive for many more years, and even opened up a museum in Florida called the Museum of Sunken Treasure to show off his findings from his many adventures. Up until this point, McKee's expedition was probably the most exciting and notable thing to happen involving Gorda Key. However, by the 70s and 80s, that would definitely change. In the 1960s, approximately 150 acres of the island was purchased by a businessman by the name of Alvin Tucker. He had already lived in the Bahamas at that point and was pretty well off for himself. Well off enough that part of his plans for the island included building a runway for his own private plane. Now, at this point, the island wasn't really what you would consider populated. A handful of people used it for farmland during the right season, but there was no village or city or anything notable on the island. It was largely left alone. Even though Tucker owned the land, he didn't even live on the island full time. 
By the late 1970s, the U.S. was facing a problem. The drug trade was on the rise and much of the drugs entering into the country from South America was coming in through Florida. Among the many, many different ways they were smuggling it in, one of the ways included making stops on Caribbean islands to transfer the contraband from one plane to another or from plane to boat, which would then make its way to the States. Now here's Gorda Key, a mostly uninhabited and unknown island in the Bahamas that just happens to have a paved 2400 foot long runway. I mean, what do you think is gonna happen? It wouldn't take long for smugglers to start using the island as a pit stop on their way to the US. So by this point, Tucker couldn't even visit his own island without putting his life on the line. Without any value or use for the land, he decided to sell it off so it could become somebody else's problem. What he didn't realize at the time, however, was that the buyer he sold it to just so happened to be Frank Barber, the very smuggler that was already using it. The island was seized as a part of a raid that also resulted in the confiscation of over $100 million worth of contraband, and the land was subsequently returned to the Bahamian government. While Disney sure loves a colorful story, they understandably didn't have that in mind when they were looking for an island to buy for their upcoming cruise venture. Instead, it was likely the two beautiful beaches and the proximity to Central Florida that won over Disney. And in 1996, for an undisclosed price, they'd purchase a 99-year lease on the island with plans to transform it into a Caribbean paradise. Now, the idea of buying a small island for a cruise line wasn't new at that point. Norwegian Cruise Line pioneered the idea in the 1970s when they purchased Great Stirrup Key and other lines had followed suit over the years. However, Disney did have one idea in mind that would be new for the industry. Up until that point, when it came to stopping at smaller islands, it was standard for cruise ships to anchor off the coast of the island and then ferry passengers back and forth using a smaller boat. The process was known as tendering, since the ships used to ferry the passengers were called tenders. They carried that name because these smaller boats were used to, well, tend to larger ships. Disney, however, felt that the process was cumbersome and slow, and that it would be far more convenient for passengers if they could freely board and leave the ship throughout the day. So they decided to build a dock for their cruise ships. This was no easy task. Typically, you try to build docks where it'll fit the larger ships, but these small islands in the Bahamas have fairly shallow water. So Disney hired the American Bridge Company to dredge up over 50,000 truckloads of material on the south side of the island. It was used to simultaneously create a channel deep enough for the cruise ships to enter, while also creating a man-made landmass that passengers would disembark onto. In short, they dug out this to build this. Obviously not wanting to disrupt the paradise they just purchased, a lot of effort went into making the operation as non-invasive as possible. Les Snyder, VP of Construction at American Bridge, said that, quote, the layout of the landing island was very cautiously planned. The location was picked to avoid digging into coral, and the coral that did exist nearby was carefully covered with a protective netting during construction to avoid any potential damage. Even the trees removed during the island's development were relocated to a temporary tree farm before being planted elsewhere. While Disney's typical MO at the time was to construct a perfect fantasy world from the ground up, it was very clear that Disney wanted to leave as much of Gorda Key, now Castaway Key, as intact as possible. While industry experts outside of the company speculated that Disney might develop the island to feature more theme park style offerings, Disney ultimately went with a minimalist approach, focusing on the beaches themselves. They even kept the paved runway, transforming it into the path that connects the island's two beaches. As for the price tag for all of this, nobody outside of Disney knows. Industry experts estimated the cost at $25 million, however Disney wouldn't disclose the actual price. They did, however, confirm that the final price was actually higher than the $25 million estimate. So all we really know is that it cost more than that. Today, the island is still a popular stop along Disney's Caribbean cruise itineraries, and it is almost universally praised for its beauty and simplicity. It just happens to be beauty and simplicity with a very interesting history.